Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chan enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science service publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to the seventh webinar in our Generation Chemical Partnership series. Today's webinar is titled, The Male Reproductive Health Crisis, Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and Racial Inequities. This webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the University of California, San Francisco's Program on Reproductive Health the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility Societies, and UCSF's Environment Research and Translation for Health Center. We will leave time following the presentation and panel discussion for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. The chat feature is also available for attendees to make comments and join the discussion with our speakers. For those of you who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the join or click on the webinar tab. Um, and um, we will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. The chat features, sorry, I skipped there. You can download these by going to healthenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone in our webinar is muted right now with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our Kong webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, as Hannah mentioned, this is the seventh webinar in a series on the impact of environmental exposures on reproductive health, pregnancy, and development. <clears throat> I encourage any of you in the audience to watch the YouTube videos of the previous webinars if you've missed them. Um, through the series, we've heard from such a diverse array of scientists, and today we are so excited to have a presentation and discussion about the male reproductive health crisis endocrine disrupting chemicals and racial inequities. Thank you all for joining us. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I, I just wanna briefly thank um, our partners uh, in the series, the University of California, San Francisco Program on Reproductive uh, Health, um, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility Societies, and UCSF's Environmental uh, Environment Research and Translation for Health Center. So our first speaker today um, is Dr. Sheila Sathiana Rayana, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Adjunct Associate Professor within the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington. She serves as a center director for the Infant Development in Environment Study. She is also a co-principal investigator for the NIH Environmental Factors Affecting Children Health Outcomes Pathways Study at the University of Washington and the Seattle Children's Research Institute. Our second speaker today is Dr. Ann Olson, um, who is an occupational cancer epidemiologist in the environment and lifestyle epidemiology branch at the International Agency for Research on Cancer in France. Thank you for joining us um, from Europe. Uh, her primary interest is conducting multi-center epidemiological studies to identify environmental and occupational risk factors for human cancers. Much of this involves coordination and collaboration within large international consortia such as the NORD test study a uh, registry-based case control study of testicular germ cell tumors nested in the general populations of Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, which she will be discussing today. Um, then we will have a presentation from um, Dr. Melissa Perry and Nathan McRae. Dr. Melissa Perry is professor and chair of environmental and occupational health and professor of epidemiological, uh, epidemiolo epidemiology and biostatistics at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. She is past president of the American College of Epidemiology and is currently co-chair of the National Academies of Sciences Engineering and Math Committee on Emerging Sciences for Environmental Health Decision Making. 
She leads an environmental epidemiological epidemiol epidemiology lab at George Washington investigating the reproductive health effects of pesticides and other environmental contaminants. And finally, Nathan McRae um, is an epidemiology research associate for the Pennsylvania Department of Health Division of Environmental Health Epidemiology. He earned an MPH at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Um, he worked with Dr. Melissa Perry um, there as a researcher and recruiter for several studies on male reproductive health. And he has also collaborated on research pertaining to endocrine um, disorders, phthalates, and chronic kidney disease of unknown origin. So with that, um, I will uh, pass it over to you, Sheila. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, first, can everyone hear me and can you see my slides? Yes, everything's great. Great, okay. Thanks. Well, first, I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to this important topic. Um, I think that male reproductive health is often ignored in our society, um, but there's certainly a lot of research to be learned in this area. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, phthalate exposure and male genitourinary development uh, from the newborn period. And I think others on this call are going to talk about the later periods in life for males. Oh, for some reason I'm having trouble advancing. Okay. Uh, so the chemicals that I've been studying for quite a long time are phthalates, and these are probably not new to most people um, who are listening on this call, but they're endocrine disrupting chemicals, and there's a class of them. Uh, the diethyl hexyl phthalate, DHP, is in flexible plastics, um, and it's also found in processed foods, and BBZP, butyl benzyl phthalate, has also been found in a lot of processed foods. Some of the shorter chain phthalates like DEP and DBP are found in personal care products. Um, they're also found in soft squeezy toys, as well as the high molecular weight phthalates are found there. These are the phthalates that were first used and in production. And over the past several years, there's been newer phthalates, higher molecular weight phthalates that have similar functions um, that are now replacements for these. But the past data on toxicity really focuses on these classes here. So these chemicals really are found in all of us. They're ubiquitous um, and this is a diagram of a pregnant woman who is exposed to phthalates, um, as well as her pregnant fetus who's exposed through her exposure. And so uh, you can see that there's a vinyl shower curtain here, which might have DHP. There's a plastic cup that she's drinking from. And then there's lotion, which would have dibutyl phthalate. And all of these enter through these various routes of exposure, and then they get metabolized. And those metabolites um, can pass on to the fetus and develop and affect development. So why are we so concerned about these chemicals? Uh, this is a syndrome that was put forth many years ago um, by many different scientists. Um, these are, I'm just citing two kind of the seminal papers. But there is a syndrome that has been identified by which a maternal dam is exposed to DEHP, which is a known antiandrogen. And therefore, the male offspring will have a variety of abnormalities in male genital development. And so some of these frank malformations are in male genitalia, the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, Hypospadias, um, which is an abnormal positioning of the urethral opening on the penis, or undescended testes. Um, these are frank malformations. What we also see is a reduced anogenital distance um, in these male offspring. And so how is this occurring? It's usually occurring through decreased testosterone production. So this pregnant dam is exposed. And what they're showing here is the testosterone production in the offspring. And you can see in a control animal that is not exposed, this nice peak of testosterone. But in an exposed animal, you see a complete blunting of that. 
So you do not see that testosterone production with high DHP exposure. And so we think that that's the mechanism um, by which these malformations are occurring. And so this brings us to the testicular dysgenesis syndrome, which is kind of the human correlate of that phthalate syndrome. And this syndrome was put forth by Neil Skekebeck and his group from Denmark years ago. And what they postulated is that there are environmental factors, and here we're talking about phthalates today, and genetic defects that lead to testicular dysgenesis. And then you can have effects on Leydig cell function, which are specialized cells in the testes, or Sertoli, Sertoli cell function. Um, I am going to stay on this path here, where if you have decreased Leydig cell function, you have androgen insufficiency and potentially hypospadias and cryptorchidism. And we postulate that anogenital distance is also within this spectrum. You can also have effects on this other part of the pathway, which I think others will talk about in more detail. So anogenital distance, um, what is it? And this is kind of a visual representation. Um, it is an intermediate phenotype of male reproductive development. And when we do these measurements, we do them from the anus to the base of the scrotum or the anus to the base of the penis. Um, we also have done penile width measurements, but they have not been nearly as accurate. Um, and they're much harder to measure um, than these anogenital distances. And so this is a study um, that Shauna Swan uh, published years ago. She, was, uh, she has been and continues to be one of my mentors and collaborators over time. And what she showed is that with increasing phthalate exposure, which is what you see here from the 25th to 75th percentile, that's what these colors are representing, the likelihood of having a shortened AGD increases. And so when you go from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile, you have a 13-fold uh, likelihood of having a shortened anogenital distance. Um, and that's in kind of a dose response pattern. And then there have been systematic reviews and meta-analyses on whether this occurs across studies and across populations. And so this was actually a National Academies of Science systematic review that I participated on um, with a committee um, where we did a systematic review and we also did a meta-analysis. And this is a publication from that of the meta-analysis specifically. And you can see here that in our primary analysis, there were several studies that looked at diethyl hexyl phthalate exposure uh, in pregnancy in relation to anogenital distance. Uh, and you can see that these beta coefficients are low. So a smaller anogenital distance um, related to higher phthalate exposure across studies. Um, and when you combine these in the meta-analysis, you had a four millimeter smaller AGD with a tenfold increase in uh, DHP. And when you did a leave one out analysis, uh, you saw pretty similar results, meaning that no, the, no uh, one of these studies isn't abnormally influencing the results of the meta-analysis. Really, they all are trending towards having very similar results. So quite a bit of evidence to show that phthalates are affecting anogenital distance in males. And a recent uh, study um, put forth by a group in Europe, combined uh, anogenital distance measurements across several uh, different studies. Um, they used the methods from our study, the Infant Development and Environment Study, to kind of look at what are reference ranges for these AGD concentrations, or I'm sorry, AGD measurements. And uh, all of these, uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but all of these are different centers that are, rep that are represented. Um, and what is important to notice here is that you do see the anogenital distance change and what we think of as growth over time up until about six months, and then it plateaus. Um, and so what we think is that the anogenital distance is uh, sensitive to hormone concentrations in this early time period, but then it really stabilizes and stays consistent over time. And there really have been no studies that have followed anogenital distance from birth through adulthood yet, um, but we hope to have those kinds of data 
uh, in the future. And so what is the relevance of this reduced anogenital distance? There's several publications that show the clinical significance of this. When they've looked at adult males, they've seen that there's a shortened anogenital distance um, in men who have lower sperm counts compared to normal men, men who have hypospadias um, or who had hypospadias when they were younger compared to normal men. Um, similarly, a smaller uh, difference um, in men who had prostate cancer compared to controls uh, and non-obstructive uh, azospermia uh, as well as hypospadias. And so you can see that in adult men that the shortened anogenital distance is found in um, those men who have reproductive defects um, of a variety of, in a variety of conditions. Um, this is sperm count, hypospadias, prostate cancer. So that's a variety of different um, reproductive conditions in which we see the shortened anogenital distance. So in terms of overall significance, EPA identifies ADT is a reproductive toxicity endpoint, um, and I acknowledges it as a well-known marker of in uterine androgen exposure. There are now several human studies that document an association between a smaller AGD and male reproductive abnormalities in adulthood. Um, and really, this can translate to humans and be a phenotype for sentinel markers for future male reproductive outcomes. So I just wanted to get into a little bit of the data from our study, the Infant Development and Environment Study. I've been working on this study for over a decade now, and our, our kids are almost nine, 10 years old, um, and we still continue to follow them. But at the beginning, we were trying to determine if phthalate exposure was associated with reproductive outcomes in male infants. Um, and the original aims of the grant were to focus on anogenital distance and developing reliable methods um, for obtaining these measurements. But one of the things that I had wanted to do was to determine, well, beyond AGD, do we see any other newborn reproductive abnormalities? Um, and this table is showing the odds of having a genital anomaly at birth in relation to phthalate concentrations. And you can see here that the odds of having any anomaly in relation to DHP exposure, um, with, you had a 2.5 fold increased odds of having any anomaly with, um, with DHP exposure. Um, and this was really driven by hydrocele, which is a collection of fluid um, in the testes that you find at birth. We did not see significant associations with hypospadias or undescended testes, but our sample size was very low here. This was a healthy pregnancy cohort and we were not powered to really see that. But you do see increased odds with MBP and MBZP as well. They just did not reach statistical significance here. And we did not see a relationship between the infant AGD and anomalies in this specific analysis. One other thing that we looked at was prenatal hormone concentrations in relation to the genital anomalies that we saw, um, because the hypothesis is, is that phthalates reduce testosterone concentration in utero. Um, and what we saw is that with increasing testosterone concentration, we had a significantly reduced odds of having a genital anomaly. So that really follows um, the pathway by which we understand how male genital development occurs. And here we did not see a relationship between prenatal hormone concentrations and AGD. And that could be for a variety of reasons, um, most likely because the prenatal hormone concentration isn't directly reflecting fetal concentrations. So in terms of our findings from TIDES, um, we found that first trimester phthalate exposures were associated with an increased risk of having a male genital anomaly at birth. And this was driven by hydrocele specifically. Um, there were no significant relationships with hypospadias and cryptorchidism, potentially due to low power. Um, and we did not observe a relationship between AGD uh, and these anomalies. Um, and this may be because phthalates are acting through multiple pathways to affect genital development. Um, 
we did observe a lower odds of having an anomaly with higher prenatal testosterone concentrations, which confirms the current literature relating to hormonal impacts on genital development. And one of the things that we found was that we thought that hydrocele may be a novel marker of anti-androgen exposure that could be easily studied in humans because there is quite a high incidence of hydrocele when babies are born. And so if you go back to this testicular dysgenesis syndrome, I think a couple of the things that we added or um, we felt like are in these pathways are that phthalates can affect hormone concentrations. I didn't show a lot of data on this, but the phthalates were related to lower uh, testosterone in pregnancy. And then also when you come down here, in terms of anogenital distance, we also feel that hydrocele could be uh, in this spectrum of male genital development, along with a shortened anogenital distance uh, and hypospadias and cryptorchidism. And so this is just to summarize that when a pregnant mom is exposed to these antiandrogens, that exposure is associated with changes to maternal fetal estrogen and testosterone concentrations and does lead to some male reproductive tract abnormalities, including smaller anogenital distance and male genital um, abnormalities such as hydrocele. And that was the end of my presentation. I just want to acknowledge um, all our study participants, our entire study team, which is too many people to put on this slide, um, Shauna, of course, um, and Rich Grady, who is a urologist who helped with these measurements, and of course, our funding. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. While we're waiting for our next speaker to pull up her slides, I would like to remind everyone to start submitting your questions in the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We'll begin the Q&A session after our panel discussion and the final speaker's presentation. And it looks like, Anne, you have your slides up and just about ready to go. It looks great. We'll just need you to unmute, Anne. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So I also thank you for your invitation. This is a very interesting webinar for me. I'm not a specialist in this subject and I'm learning new things already. Uh, so I have the pleasure to talk about parental occupational exposures and testicular germ cell tumors in sons and about a specific uh, study called NORTEST. Uh, so first, let us uh, look at the incidence of testicular cancer in men all ages globally. Here we see that the dark colors uh, indicate uh, high incidence, and uh, it is particularly uh, Europe, North America, Australia, and uh, Argentina, and Chile in South America. However, if we look more specifically on the top 20 list, we can uh, see that there is a slight variation between those countries as well. And this is very interesting because uh, in the previous decade, uh, it was solely le the Nordic countries that were uh, sort of uh, above all the others with very high uh, comparable incidence rates. And now we see that uh, the incidence is increasing in, in other countries and, and, and uh, sort of uh, in the Nordic countries it's leveling uh, between, well, it's, it's the increase is uh, reducing. So the epidemiology of testicular cancer is that it's a relatively rare tumor. It's the, it represents less than 1% of cancers in men, but it is the most common cancer type in males aged 15 to 35 years. Uh, and uh, as we saw on the previous slide, the incidence is higher in, in males of European ancestry, but it has been increasing in various geographical regions in the last decades. And migration studies shows that the first generation immigrants uh, sort of have the same uh, level of risk as uh, the, their original country, while the second generation immigrants gained a similar level of risk as the new 
natives, uh, suggesting a role of environmental factors. And uh, so therefore we, we uh, hypothesize that uh, early life exposures play a, an important role. But this is very difficult to study because it is such a, a rare cancer. And for this reason, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, all these uh, names here on the, the slide because they made a, a large effort to put together the NORTES study. It is uh, Joachim Schutz uh, from the International Agency for Re Research on Cancer and Beatrice Ferrevers from a university in, in Lyon, as well as Nordic representatives from cancer uh, registries, from universities and uh, uh, from occupational health institutes in, in the Nordic countries. So the Nordic uh, uh, Nordtest study is a registry-based case control study, and it aims to examine the association between parental occupational exposures before childbirth and testicular germ cell tumor in the sons. This is the type of testicular cancer that is uh, the, the, the main and uh, represent at least 95% of all testicular cancers. And we were particularly interested in pesticides, solvents, and heavy metals in, in parents because we know that those are endocrine uh, disrupting uh, substances. So in the Nordic countries, uh, we have, I'm Swedish, we have a unique personal identifier ID number from birth that follows all through life. And this allows uh, us to sort of merge different registries uh, with this uh, personal ID number. So in this study, we obtained uh, uh, cancer information uh, from the cancer registry. Uh, we uh, obtained control subjects from the central population registry as well as family member, members to the, the patients. We also had census information for the occupational codes and birth registries and hospital discharge data, databases also provided information of uh, congenital malformations and other things. So to assign exposures to the parents, uh, before and closest to the year of childbirth. Uh, we applied a country-specific job exposure matrix uh, for the Nordic countries. And this job exposure matrix assigns uh, a P to each job, which means the proportion of workers exposed in this job, and also the mean exposure level among the exposed, which is represented by an L. And then we, we used uh, conditional logistic regression models to estimate uh, odds ratios and 95% uh, confidence intervals uh, for uh, testicular germ cell tumors associated with maternal and paternal occupational exposures. So one type of analysis was just non-exposed when the P is equal to zero and exposed when the P is more than zero. And then we have other uh, alternatives where we have group uh, subjects into non-exposed, low and medium uh, and high. And that is when we uh, choose another uh, uh, cut point for the prevalence of exposure in, in um, of the proportion of exposure workers exposed and a different cut point for the for level of exposure as well. So here we start with results for known risk factors. And this is family history uh, of testicular cancer. It is a risk factor for testicular cancer in the sons, especially for siblings, a fivefold increased risk. We also have these congenital malformations that we heard in the previous uh, uh, presentation that are also in, uh, associated with increased risk of testicular cancer in, 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 this, in the subjects. Uh, but we can also see the percent uh, of exposed among cases and controls. And we see that family history is very rare among uh, testicular cancer patients. And also uh, the congenital malformations cannot explain 
the whole risk. So there are other risk factors that must be discovered. The first paper that was derived from this study was on pesticides. And here we did not observe any increased risk for maternal exposure, uh, while a slight increase for high exposure uh, for paternal exposure. And here it's important to notice that we did not have sufficient numbers to look at specific uh, types of pesticides. It is only any or that was possible in, in this study. And this is, of course, a limitation. The next uh, uh, paper that came out was on heavy metals and welding fumes uh, in, in parents. And here we observed a small increased risk for high paternal exposure to chromium before birth and also a, a signal for welding fumes, which contains uh, metal exposure. Uh, and there was no association with maternal exposure to heavy metals and welding fumes. But this uh, sort of derived uh, more interest. So we, we looked at uh, setting the cutoffs for exposed uh, higher. That means that the prevalence of exposure in workers were more than 50%, uh, and the level of exposure was larger than the median for all exposed jobs to chromium. And here we, we did see a el moderate elevated uh, odds ratio of 1.37. And a similar finding for welding fumes, although it was not the highest uh, exposure category that came out. Then we redid the, this uh, uh, analysis in Denmark, and we kept Denmark separately because the occupational information is in a different format. Here, the occupational data does not come from censuses. It is instead the Danish Supplementary Pension Fund that includes all employees from 16 years of age that have ever worked uh, in, in Denmark. And they report uh, the employment to the Supplementary Pension Fund each year. So it's much more objective and it's much more uh, sort of precise in relation to the uh, to the childbirth and conception of the, of the pregnancy. And here we did not uh, see any elevated risk for chromium separately. And the only thing that popped out was when we had a category looking at lead, we had to have a reference category with no heavy metals. And then many of the, uh, of the metals occur together and therefore we had to do different groupings of metals. So one was at least lead and showed nothing. And then other metals showed an elevated risk. And then we looked more precisely what those uh, metals were. And then we found that 90%, 99% of those in this category were exposed to chromium and toluene, which is a solvent. And more precisely, the, a large proportion of these uh, subjects worked in the wood industry. And of course, this is complicated because uh, wood uh, industry, they are indeed uh, exposed to, to metals, chromium. It's, uh, it's sometimes in, included in uh, preservatives of, of uh, wood, but uh, woodworkers are also in exposed to fungicides, for example, uh, pesticides, which was not assessed in, in this analysis. And woodworkers are also exposed to other chemicals when working with, with wood products, like formaldehyde, for example. So we cannot con draw much conclusion from this. And then when we looked at only chromium and adjusted for any for solvents, then we also found an increased 
the risk for chromium. So there is some, definitely something there. And uh, a third paper or fourth paper that came from this study was on solvents. And here we don't did not observe any, in, or for paternal exposure, we did not observe an increased risk for solvent exposure. However, for maternal uh, exposure to solvents, we observe a significant decreased risk uh, in sons whose mothers were exposed to aromatic hydrocarbons, and those include benzene and toluene. But we did not see any exposure response relationship for either of those solvents. So these were the results that we have uh, until now from the Nortest study. And uh, our section is also involved in a French nationwide case control study in France. It's called TESTIS. And uh, it is based on 472 cases and uh, about twice the number of control subjects. And uh, it was completed uh, as late as 2016, I think. And uh, now uh, there are the first uh, results coming. Uh, we are interested in domestic uh, exposures to uh, chemicals, including pesticides. I'm personally involved in the professional uh, branch uh, stream, where we will look at pesticides, uh, again, solvents and metals in this study. We also look at environmental exposures to pesticides and, uh, and other uh, issues. And there is also genomic component under development. And what is interesting here is that we will be able to look at the parents but also uh, on the subjects themselves in early childhood and adolescence and uh, well, occupation also, although these men are quite young, so they are they usually don't have a, an enormous uh, occupational history when they uh, obtain or when they get their cancer. So my conclusion is that we did not provide uh, strong evidence for an association of uh, testicular cancer with parental occupational exposures to pesticides, heavy metals, or solvents. Uh, however, I, I don't think we can exclude uh, uh, an increased risk either. We have some signals, but the problem is that we have rather crude exposure assessment. The census data is uh, usually valid, it's just that we don't have the precise uh, point uh, when uh, the relevant time point. And also there are quite crude job titles. So it's uh, difficult to assign specific exposures. We also have potential misclassification of exposures due to the inter-individual variation. As we mentioned already that one job does not mean that all are exposed in the same uh, manner. And also that we are doing multiple testing because we are interested in several exposures. But we, we really want to, to explore uh, potential underlying biological mechanisms for the observed associations. That is paternal exposure to chromium and maternal exposure to uh, aromatic hydrocarbon solvents. And uh, well, this must, it, it, it's difficult to do it better in an epidemiological study because it's such a rare cancer. Uh, but uh, I think it can also be explored in, in experimental models, uh, these specific exposures. So this was what I have to present today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne, for your presentation. While um, we're having Nathan pull up the slides, I'd like to remind you, feel free to put in some questions in the Q&A, and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar, when Karen will be asking the questions verbally to all of our speakers, um, and so we'll get answers to you. All right, and it looks like Nathan's just about ready, and uh, Dr. Perry will pass this off to you. 
Uh, Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Che, and all of the support in the audience. I'm delighted. This has been a fantastic series on reproductive health, and I'm really excited that you are on male reproductive health today. Uh, we're delighted to be part of this. You know that you're aging in the field when you begin a presentation talking about the historical context, sentences saying things like, well, I've been studying the issue of sperm for about 30 years. Um, it's a long time, and there's a lot of um, background and research that goes into the topic for today. Um, in fact, we've been thinking about the declines in sperm for at least 30 years. Testicular dysgenesis syndrome, the first paper um, Neil Skakiabak published was in 2001. Um, I've been looking at pesticides and uh, sperm for quite some time. There have been about 30 years of research on that area, and also awareness about environmental justice. Uh, um, some of the earliest reports really uh, date back to about 40 years. So the of these topics um, on this presentation today are all about how we have failed to recognize the importance of uh, reproductive health, chemical exposure, and fertility evaluation for men of color. And it wasn't until uh, working at GW and having the privilege of being able to recruit very ethnically diverse um, participants into our reproductive health studies did I realize that most of the other studies in male reproductive health had not been very diverse. So our goal today is to raise this awareness with our audience and actually to give you some qualitative perspective, a narrative by simply asking men of color, what do they think about environmental health? What do they think about fertility? What do they think about sperm studies? Uh, what's on their mind when it comes to these issues? So I wanna share that information with you. Uh, next slide, Nate. I was delighted to see the AGD work and also recognition of Shauna Swan. She just really has been a foremother um, in understanding the importance of sperm health and seminal patterns in recognizing declines over the past 30 years. I remember her earlier papers, they were met with lots of controversy, a lot of skepticism, and those original hypotheses have just developed further and further and been further um, uh, borne out in a lot of empirical information. And so in case you haven't uh, seen it, I don't want you to miss her great book that's out this year, uh, Countdown, that's uh, taking a very careful look at decades of research and evidence demonstrating that over the past 50 years, we're seeing about a 50% decline in sperm health. And the um, meta-analysis by Levin and all really helps to um, reinforce those original hypotheses that Shauna uh, published uh, about 30 years ago. So there's been further and further, not only attention, but also acknowledgement that these are real patterns and that chemicals are likely contributing to the de decline in sperm quality. Next slide. I mentioned environmental justice. So while this country, the United States has woken up, um, especially during this time of COVID, to major uh, inequities and systemic racism in this country, this isn't a new idea at all. And uh, recently our group put together a paper where we were able to um, uh, track back to where the ideas about environmental justice first came. And it wasn't from the environmental health movement, but actually from the civil rights movement, where uh, civil rights activists recognized that people of color were being disproportionately impacted by environmental hazards, by, by um, poor air, by chemical spills, and that they were overlooked in um, being the ones most burdened and at risk. And so these two reports were germinal reports, um, the United Church of Christ report in 1987, and then followed up with another report in 2007, each time demonstrating further, especially via geography, how disproportionate these hazards were, were to be found in marginalized communities and in communities of color that didn't have the power to uh, polluting industries. So it's not a, a, a new idea. Um, and at the same time, our ability to fully integrate communities of color in 
uh, environmental health research is lagging and needs to push forward. Next, next slide. This is, we're using this as a way to exemplify uh, some of those um, uh, g major gaps. And I guess I would ask you to ask yourself, when's the last time you read an article um, or a paper that described um, the perspectives of African-American men in environmental health or in fertility? And as I say, working at GW allowed me to realize that that really was not a perspective that we were finding in most of our pi uh, prior reproductive health studies. And so as we looked into it further, we're realizing that very little is known. The infertility experience of, com of uh, couples of color, very little is known about what are the normative sperm parameters of men of color, of uh, black, Hispanic, uh, Asian men, and living dates, men of different nativity. Um, we have seen a few reports that have mentioned this, and here are some examples. Um, one study did find that being non-white ethnicity, you had a lower likelihood of infertility evaluation. Um, that could be attributable to insurance patterns and whether or not you're covered for in, in, uh, infertility evaluation. And if you have uh, low resources and public insurance, you're not going to have a, a very comprehensive workup for infertility. Um, by and large, the what is known about infertility is based on European American couples. Let's move on to the next slide. This has a major impact on how we treat infertility and who gets treated, and also how we define infertility. And for those of you that have done any work in sperm, you know that uh, we rely heavily on the WHO standards for, for fertility evaluation find that the data used to set standards of normal and abnormal um, are almost entirely based on um, uh, European men, uh, white men, and very, very few um, with uh, diverse backgrounds and racial and ethnic identity. And here again, Shauna's work um, previously um, should be commended because it's one of the only studies that had a sizable number of men of color um, to put forward some semen parameters. So that's my backdrop um, for the presentation that Nathan McRae will give uh, better describe what the actual experiences and perceptions are of men of color when it comes to these issues of environmental health, environmental hazard, infertility, and sperm research. So let me turn things over to Nathan. Thanks, Dr. Perry. Can everyone hear me? Okay, hopefully. Yeah. All right, cool. Great. Thanks. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about our study that we conducted. It was a very small focus group study, but there are some very interesting perspectives raised that we don't hear that are often invisible. So I'm going to briefly talk about the study with some example quotes. Um, our study objective was to use expanded health belief model to explore the perceptions of barriers to and facilitators for black men from Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area becoming engaged in their environmental health, their reproductive health, participating in health research and participation in fertility research. And so, I'm sorry. Okay, so we began in the late spring 2015 with recruitment. Um, we posted flyers around the Washington, D.C. area at IRB approved locations. Uh, um, including health centers. And I think we went about a month without getting any response. Um, and so we had to change our recruitment strategy. We actually ended up using Craigslist. We posted our slides on, or, sorry, our um, uh, announcement uh, for the study on Craigslist, which actually gained some interest. And we transposed the flyer that we had onto a large poster board. So that helped us with street recruiting in terms of identifying initial interests. And so we were working with a limited time frame, So we only we're able, you know, we only able to recruit for, uh, for a limited time. We had 24 men who participate in our study across three focus groups, and we held them there at the um, at the School of Public Health in Washington D.C. at GW School of Public Health in one of the classrooms there. And on the bottom right hand side, you can see just the basic descriptive, the most frequent responses to our descriptive analyses. Median age was 48. Annual household income between 20 and 40,000. About one in two with a college degree. 
and um, um, uh, most folks, about 60% reported no children. We used in vivo for the analysis to identify themes uh, in the study. And so um, I'm just gonna go through the responses, the themes that were listed with some quotes. Um, uh, the first being environmental health. When we first asked what first comes to mind when we say environmental health, there was a wide range of responses up there at the top, everything from toxins and poisons to the health of one surrounding area. So we then probed around the biophysical definition of environment, and these are the themes that emerged. Theme number one was just concerns about pollution from the built environment. As you see here from this quote, I think about it every time I step out my house, because the cars going past, buses, like dang, you gotta breathe. So that, you know, that was one theme. Another theme though, the most, the, the, the largest source of concern were uh, exposures from housing. And that's exemplified by, by this quote. Um, well, you still got projects built with asbestos paint, lead, all that, you know, schools with that stuff in it. Anything built before 1975, nine times out of 10, it'll have lead, asbestos, stuff like that. And so there was a tie-in to the housing exposures to um, certain uh, health outcomes such as cognitive decline from, from lead. So housing was the most frequent mention of uh, exposure of concern in addition to ambient air. Theme number two with regard to the environment, there was discussion of the traditional kind of what we think of environmental justice as you see here from this quote, that's always in our community that gets the garbage trash refinery, they get the old tire places, the stuff we have in our neighborhood that's only in our neighborhood. So kind of what Dr. Perry was talking about what we've not long known in the US uh, that's been documented since the early 80s, um, you know, uh, that was elicited. But there's also a discussion about proximity to environmental goods or environmental amenities that was discussed um, as seen from this quote here. So every community that is being brought into our black community as we are being moved out and the area being redeveloped, there are then environmental things put into place. So men in our study not only recognize that the, the proximity, there is disproportionate proximity to environmental goods, but oftentimes as they saw their city being changed and gentrified, some of these environmental goods are being put in and raising housing prices. So there's kind of a twofold discussion with regard to um, environmental justice. And then lastly, just kind of related to theme one, uh, just, you know, feeling overwhelmed and, and a lack of self-efficacy to remove themselves from these environmental exposures. As you see here, everything is just, everything about life today hurts you in some way, shape, or form. The air outside, that ain't 100% healthy for you to breathe in. You know what I mean? Because you got the car fumes, you got the building fumes. So again, just kind of just feeling overwhelmed by their environmental exposures. Moving on to reproductive health. Um, when we first asked what comes to mind when we say reproductive health, the most common responses were sex and children up top there, followed by those other responses. And so when we then, you know, went into barriers and facilitators to engaging in one's reproductive health, theme number one was male pride. Um, being able to conceive was a big source of male pride and therefore running into some sort of problem conceiving was a big barrier. Um, uh, as you see here, especially as a black man who can't conceive a child. Because it's, you know, that's a taboo subject. That's really taboo. You're not going to get a whole lot of conversation from a person who can't conceive, which, which is not right. I'm not condoning it, but that's just the way it is. And so there was discussions, there were discussions that branched off from that. As you see here, I think it's some kind of stereotype that black men are supposed to be very manly and just carry around this image. But these, you know, threat to male pride prohibited folks from seeking help. And so that kind of leads into theme number two. And there were several personal stories that arose with uh, infertility, including this quote, and we weren't seeking men with infertility. We didn't market the study as an infertility study. We said it was a reproductive health study, but several quotes such as this one emerged. When my wife and I first found out we were having fertility issues, we told a couple confidants, you know, our close friends, our pastor, you know, certain family members, not all of them. And so the pastor, he was like, well, there's a couple of families in the church who have experienced the same issues, but none of them actually want to talk to us. So there's this culture of silence that kind of emerged where folks who experienced infertility kind of had nowhere to turn. And then lastly, folks didn't really start thinking about their reproductive health unless they were trying to conceive. Um, and so that was kind of a facilitator was thinking of children, whether or not actually they were intending to conceive or not. So again, another personal story emerged um, from this one. Um, and I'll just read the quote. Well, me, myself, to piggyback on what them brother said, I was the same way until I 
I went to seek medical treatment before the female. So to come to find out, like I said, shooting blanks, two years later, I'm like, what's wrong with me? I've been with this girl for four years and nothing happened. So I finally went to the doctor. They told me I was unable to conceive children. So I've been living with this for about nine years now. So this was a conversation that arose. There was a, a lot of discussion that arose uh, among those with personal stories about pushing the female partner to get tested first because of fear of you know, being uh, deemed infertile. And this was a conversation that, that arose from that. So um, moving on to health research, um, the third category, we were kind of surprised to find out that most men in our study have participated in prior research. And so a lot of the discussion revolved around the facilitators as opposed to the barriers to participating in health research. And one of the top themes was relevancy with regard to our study. And um, that was exemplified here. I was about to walk past you, but when I saw it was for African-American men, I said, oh, okay, I'll at least listen to what you have to say at that point. So this was someone who was street recruited. The quote at the bottom is very similar, as you see here. It's just that it's just never been brought to them with people of color being of concern. I would think that more black people, black men would be interested as long as they know they got they got other men coming in to contribute. And so among the men who had participated in prior health research, um, there were several folks who said, oh, this is the first time I've been a part of a study with others that look like me or with other black men or with recruiters of color. So that was something that was also brought up. Theme number two was incentive you know, to participate in the study. Anytime you offer some type of incentive, you're gonna have people show, show up. So that was also mentioned. And then theme three, a timely and clear message. Um, and this example here for theme three is kind of a negative experience that someone had or reported, but I thought it was, it was a good message. You can hold on to the condescending, arrogant individuals who think they are blessing us. So that's kind of the way, you know, the way to approach it you know, from our perspective is, you know, down to earth compassion with a clear mention and understanding of the time involved in the study, you know, being transparent about the study, honest about the study. And um, the way we approach it was we're, you know, we're here to learn from you. You know, there's not a lot, of, lot on this right now. We're here to learn from you. So that's, that was a big one. And then lastly, fertility research. While there was a lot of uh, willingness to participate in general public health research, there's more hesitation with regard to fertility research. Um, I'll skip, skip to theme two because it kind of relates to theme one, but the quote here, you say research, but it could be circumvented to go in someone else's pocket and in a certain sperm bank. And I don't want to find out in 10 years, I've got 50 kids or whatever. So there was more hesitation and kind of more mistrust over the term. And this is with regard to participating in a uh, fertility study, like a hypothetical fertility study. But there there was some willingness, there was just more ambivalence. And that's exemplified by this quote here. I definitely would want to help out for research, but I guess it's just this thing with me that's like your lifeline that you've given away. So, um, you know, provided that IRB stipulations were upheld and privacy, confidentiality, you know, correct use of the sample, there was more willingness, but there's also this reluctance to participate in a hypothetical study. So um, here's our, our summary and discussion. Um, I won't go into it now because of lack of time, but um, basically um, I, I left some references in the, in the reference list. In the yellow is what's not been studied very much, uh, especially on black community men in these perspectives. And so, um, so, you know, again, this is an exploratory study. It's not representative of all African-American men or even all urban African-American men or even all black men in DC. We weren't able to sample all wards and it's a very small study, but the point is, is that these narratives aren't heard. They're very rarely heard. Um, and, and we need more effort and, and, and in our opinion, you know, a recruiter effort to incorporate these men in sperm health studies and in infertility experience studies. Um, so we, we think that's very important. So I wanna thank, all of you for attending, um, Hannah and CHE, and also the fantastic study team, including Dr. Perry and Dr. Uh, Fran Branch, who conceived the idea for this focus group study, and of course, to all the study participants. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for all the presentations. So now um, we're gonna do a quick panel discussion before we get to the audience questions. So uh, members of the audience, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. Um, so first I have a question for maybe all of the panelists or whoever wants to can take a stab. Um, there really is, you know, 
a lot of unknowns when it comes to environmental health and male reproductive health, uh, since there are uh, many, you know, fellow researchers and scientists in Che's audience today. Could you each say something about what um, our next step, you know, what are the most urgent gaps that you think need to be filled? Um, I can jump in. I'll uh, just say that um, the fact that you're shining a light on this is very, very important. I am sure that fellow uh, male reproductive health researchers are sharing a certain amount of loneliness. <laughs> Oftentimes the paternal contribution to reproduction is largely overlooked. Um, uh, we are, I think, really far behind in our understanding of what constitutes fertility and also the various ways in which you can measure sperm health. I think we're still using very crude measures and indicators um, along a continuum. So I would say um, uh, putting forward uh, questions of defining fecundity and fertility and the accumulation of knowledge. I mentioned these decades of research, the decades of evidence of the 50% decline in, in sperm quality. Um, that has to come to a convergence of let's do something about it. And the same too with uh, the implications of chemicals and impacting on sperm health. Let's do something about it um, so that we don't come back in another five years and say that we're talking about you know 35 years of evidence. So I think that's and then of course our message for our presentation is to ensure diverse and and be very proactive about um, uh, recruiting diverse um, communities of color into our future male reproductive health studies. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? Okay. Um, oh, sure. Go ahead, Dr. Olson. Well, uh, cancer is at the end of the uh, spectrum, I, I would say. So, so, I mean, I'm sure there are environmental factors that play a role because otherwise we wouldn't see so distinct geographical differences. Uh, so we just have to continue to, to, to look uh, more precisely what chemicals and it has to be combined with uh, experimental research so we understand the, the mechanisms which are probably involved in the overall uh, male reproductive health issues. So, and, and I mean, phthalates have recently been uh, prohibited in Europe, I think. So, I mean, there, there are ways forward uh, with the limiting exposures to those chemicals. Actually, Dr. Olsen, uh, my next question is for you. A, a lot of your work has been done on occupational exposures. Um, can you talk more generally about why occupational exposures are important? Um, and why they're often overlooked, uh, you know, and then although, you know, your study may have showed some weaker associations, do you see enough evidence to apply the precautionary principle in evaluating current policy to better protect workers? Um, well, I think occupation exposures are important because they are generally higher than uh, personal exposures. Uh, so they are important for this reason. Many known carcinogens are primarily occupational exposures. So they are, I wouldn't say easier to study, but slightly less complicated to study than environmental personal exposures to these chemicals. Um, I definitely think that there is enough indications from, from sperm studies that uh, endocrine disrupting substances should be limited to the maximum. Uh, but I'm, I cannot say that uh, we can uh, change policy based on our results because they are not showing a, a exposure response relationship, for example. It, and it pops up here and there, and we cannot conclude that it's actually the agents that we have studied that are uh, the cause of our observation, but it can be something that is associated with our exposure. Uh, 
I mean, it's not good enough to say that pesticides are ex associated with an increased risk of testicular cancer because we cannot prohibit all pesticides. We have to know which one in that case. And to conclude that, we need better studies. And, and I'm not very optimistic that we can do it in epidemiological studies because they take a long time. Uh, they are very costly. Uh, are, it's a rare cancer, so it takes a long time to recruit uh, sufficient numbers to have statistical power. But it can be combined with experimental uh, studies. Uh, and therefore, perhaps the combined evidence uh, can result in recommendations or in policy changes. Thank you. Yeah. And could I, uh, could I just jump in on that too, just to add to some of Dr. Olson's comments? Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. And especially when it comes to cancer um, and at the same time, when it comes to uh, semen quality and markers of quality, concentration, motility, and morphology, um, our group just did a very extensive review of studies, again, dating back to about 30 years. Um, we're talking about 70 studies of which 50 could really, we could delve into and get um, effect estimates and con, uh, conduct a meta-analysis. And, you know, I guess the, um, we'll, we can present on those findings in the future, but long story short is that we're, see, we're seeing a strong enough weight of evidence to demonstrate that um, pesticides, especially organophosphates, are having an impact on sperm quality. And so um, I would say these measures of you know, systematic reviews, weight of evidence, risk of bias combined with meta-analyses can get us to that point of making clear policy recommendations. And of the studies that we reviewed, I'd say about a third to a half were occupational and then the other were environmental. So I think pesticide research and sperm quality is easier to do because of um, being able to recruit farmers and the circumstances in which uh, they're exposed uh, by virtue of their application. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, my next question is for Dr. Sathiana Rayana. We have many health professionals on today as well as a MD yourself. Um, what are the main takeaways that you would like them to walk away with, um, as especially as they go back to taking care of patients and you know, how do you incorporate your research into your patient care? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, before I get into that, I just, just to uh, one small comment um, based on the other presentations, um, I really, really enjoyed Dr. McCray's presentation um, in terms of, uh, being able to reach a group that is not represented um, in research. And, and I will say that almost all of the fertility studies that are done are very homogenous um, in terms of their populations. Uh, and I, I think it reflects a little bit more than just um, we're not inclusive in research, but as a society, <clears throat> fertility treatment is really um, limited to those who are very wealthy or who happen to have insurance that covers these treatments. Um, and actually those two go together, right? You see, you have, have to have that kind of job that um, can get you that kind of insurance. And so we really are in our healthcare system creating um, significant bias um, through our insurance policies. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, from a healthcare practitioner standpoint, so when I talk with families, I try not to, um, first, I have a couple principles, try not to scare people. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important to remember is that we do live in an industrialized society. We're exposed to a lot of different chemicals. We're never going to get to zero. And that's really not the goal. The goal is to try to reduce your exposures as much as possible and to try to live um, a healthy, lifestyle um, that supports the health outcomes that you um, that are your goals and that you would like to achieve. Um, and so I have some handouts on specific um, actions people can take to reduce their exposures um, that I give. Um, and then I in our environmental health specialty units, our pediatric environmental health specialty units, which are funded by CDC and EPA, um, we 
do do direct consults. Um, we try to do them more to practitioners and the state and government level, but sometimes we do um, individual consults for specific exposure that a family might have. And we did just get uh, funded to do to look at occupational um, exposures and counsel women in occupational settings. Um, so we have developed that capability too. Great. Thank you so much. Um, following up on, you know, a little bit of what you were talking about. Um, uh, Nathan, I and Dr. Perry, I had a question for you, for you guys. Um, you know, in addition to the, you know, national conversation we are now having on systemic racism, there's also been a lot more awareness about the black maternal mortality crisis in America. Um, but we haven't heard very much about um, black male health or reproductive health for that matter. Um, you know, you know, obviously the issues are very multifaceted and complex, but could you put your talk today in context of this larger conversation that we're having now? Um, and how important of a role should, you know, environmental health or environmental justice play in these conversations? Awesome question, Nate. I really want you to, to um, provide your perspectives. We've been talking about it for a number of years, so I know you've got some great things to say. Yes, you know, um, I think it's just imperative that we go beyond. Well, first of all, I think it's important to look at table ones of studies, like just a descriptive, like what are we looking at? Like not just the findings, you know, um, now, there are very interesting findings and in associations that are found, but that's how we originally came to know like, hey, there's not a lot of men of color. And this, we weren't able to recruit with Latino men, but it, you know, the same exposures happen for them too. So it's important to look at table ones and remind ourselves too. The second thing I would say is we've long known that health disparities, which have existed for so long, they continue to exist. So once you look at the table ones, like go beyond that, you know, it's not just, oh, let's report another health disparity, but like, what is driving that health disparity, you know, and we see it for black men and black women, and we see it with other racial ethnic groups too. And so, um, you know, simply reporting, you know, you get in, in my opinion, you get in a danger if you just report on the health disparity, because without really digging deeper and, and wondering about the how place matters in that, because then you kind of allow folks to jump to their own conclusions and, you know, come up with things that might not be quite right, you know, or not, might not be, might be way off, you know? So that's where I would suggest as a starting point, um, you know, to help us better understand these health disparities. I don't know if Dr. Perry, you want to chime in. <clears throat> awesome, Nate, that's awesome. Um, the group just joined together, uh, many members of the lab, several students and staff um, joined together to write a commentary about the importance of environmental epidemiology focusing on systemic racism. And as Nate said, I think too often we just use race as a variable. We measure it, whatever it means, and then we might find um, uh, associations and then we never seek to explain it. We kind of just say, well, maybe it's cultural, maybe it's biological. And we don't uh, delve any deeper and we certainly don't talk about racism. So this is our opportunity to be very earnest about it and to recognize the impact, the profound impact of societal factors influencing access to care, influencing risk of environmental exposures, uh, influencing access to information. So um, just being very deliberate, I, I love Nate's idea about uh, take a look at table one and see what it looks like. Great, thank you so much. Actually, we had a um, moving on to um, audience questions. We had a question actually for you, Nathan, what are some next steps for your, um, for your research? Yes, well, um, we, we uh, honestly need to, in my opinion, well, all right. So for Dr. Perry's lab, we actually used um, some of the lessons, particularly with regard to researching and researching men for sperm health studies to, um, for our own community-based recruitment of uh, a, a sperm health study that we were doing. So those lessons that we received there were used to increase, which we already had a pretty good sizable number of diverse participants in her sperm health community-based study, but this, this helped us with that, including use of, of, of Craigslist type of media and messaging for that. Um, uh, I currently work for the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and I am trying to incorporate these lessons for me as um, 
We engage with community members in Pennsylvania about the envir their environmental exposures here. So that, that's, that's kind of one of my uh, next steps personally. Um, and then um, GW students have actually begun to kind of get engaged with the, with the environmental justice and become active in the community. I think we still need, there's a lot more to be done um, with regard to even just, you know, um, uh, uh, meeting folks in DC where they, where, where they are and uh, discussing fertility specifically, qualitatively fertility um, instances specifically. It's really heartbreaking for those of you who, I, you know, um, reading the personal stories are really heartbreaking. And especially if you, um, uh, there's one in my references, there's a book called Semen Secrets about this woman, black woman who's, whose husband dealt with infertility. Um, you know, it really kind of puts it in perspective. So don't forget the narratives I would also advise to in addition to the very interesting research findings. So yeah, it's a long winded answer. But. Great, thank you. Let's see, we had another question. Um, we actually had two questions about um, mixtures. Um, it seems that, you know, many environmental um, exposures uh, are not, um, you know, in the, there, many of them are done simultaneously in real life. <laughs> so how do we think about um, how to incorporate mixtures into your studies and are you looking at mixtures? Um, well, I can start with that one. So, um, you know, with um, any research question, you kind of want to determine, um, well, what is your end goal, um, you know, with your study? Um, and also looking at mechanisms of action with the exposures. Um, and so uh, for our own research, we have started to look much more at mixtures. Um, we will look at the entire slate of phthalates and we've started to look across chemical classes and mixtures as well. And there's a lot of great methods um, on how to do this. Um, but I, Think that that's just one way to address these questions. Um, specifically, when you think about the phthalates, and I answered this in one of the questions um, earlier um, in the Q&A, is that some phthalates have anti-androgen action and others really don't, or at least you do not see that in vitro. Um, and we see that paralleled in human studies. Um, so if you really want to look at the anti-androgen effect, um, then you focus in on those specific chemicals. So I think you need to think about it, not just as the, we're exposed to this broad exposure of chemicals, let's just throw them all in a model. Um, you need to kind of think about specifically what are the questions you're trying to ask um, in that analysis. Dr. Olson, are you, are you guys looking at mixtures or Dr. Perry? Um, this is a everlasting challenge for us because uh, workers are unfortunately not exposed to one carcinogen at a time. It's uh, often a, a cocktail. And in particular, when it comes to metals, because they are very correlated with many solvents. Uh, so to disentangle the effect is, is a big challenge. Um, yes, we have also looked at multiple pesticides. Our best analyses are um, looking at interactions and then basically stratifying to unpack one at a time. I think our field has woken up to the reality of mixtures. Our methods haven't caught up to what we all recognize as um, biological threats. Um, but at the same time, finding a one uh, chemical association is enough to pay attention to. So I think the mixtures question becomes, and what does this mean in addition, either additive, uh, synergistic, multiplicative uh, interactions? And that can be left to quantitative assessment um, and, and modeling. But to begin with that main effect is something that can be actionable. Uh, so let us not get too mired in the perfect mixtures analysis to make conclusions about the health impacts of one chemical at a time. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, one last question because we're already 10 minutes over. Um, 
Could you, uh, the panelists, comment about um, including um, fathers, males in um, epidemiology, um, in studies looking at fertility, uh, child health, and early exposures, um, either preconception or postconception? You know, I think as Dr. Perry, you mentioned, there's been a lot of attention on the female. Um, you know, how do we include the male component and then also the combination of the the um, the mother and father? I'll just mention quickly and turn it over to a fellow panelists that um, it's very necessary. Uh, you want to look at paternal contributions. The more that we do that, the more we understand sperm health and the exposures of the dad, the more fascinating the story becomes, preconception health as well. And to reassure that you can do at-home semen collection. You have a deficit in evaluating motility. You can't go into as great a detail as if you're doing it clinically, but you can still have men collect semen at home. And we do that all the time and it's very feasible. So uh, you can hear from other panelists their thoughts. I'll just chime in real quick about the, um, you know, uh, white men in terms of infertility are also being overlooked too. So it's like men in general are being overlooked with regard to it. So the studies have started to come out qualitatively on infertility among men, but um, you know, there's not a lot of data there either. And so um, one of the suggestions in some of the other studies I read were, you know, for focus groups anyway, consider having all men, you know, it's just so they can express what they're going through with other men, you know, that's, that could be a, a, a big way. And then kind of just talking about the, the latest research, which shows, you know, um, sperm health, some of the latest research is showing that sperm health is a marker for overall health. So if you think about your overall health, you know, and, and if sperm health is declining over several decades uh, in the West, you know, think it may, maybe framing it from that perspective could be uh, an idea. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that in our research studies, um, it definitely, the men are much more hesitant. Dads are, if we're recruiting kids, the moms um, are very willing and then they'll go, say they need to go talk to their partners um, and then we'll come back and say they're not very comfortable. Um, and I, I think we need to do a better job of reaching um, men and making them comfortable um, to participate in these studies. Um, and, you know, just from clinical work, I, I think that that starts with um, men being involved in research and men initiating these studies and having male research assistants, which hasn't been very common um, in the past. Great. Thank you so much for your time today and your presentations and for this excellent discussion. So Hannah, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Karen, and to all of our speakers. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a, video to the vi a link to the video. The next Shay EDC Strategies Partnership webinar will take place May 11th and is titled Suspect Screening, Prioritization, and Confirmation of Environmental Chemicals in Maternal Newborn Pairs from San Francisco. You can find details on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Sheila, Anne, Melissa, and Nathan for your time today. Um, thank you for presenting your important work. And to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness. Have a great day.